Okay. So we're going to talk about how we're going to deal with this spirit. These things you can write down. Now we're going to talk a little bit about the word of God for this congregation. The word in the word. This has been a lot of talking. Does it, can everybody recognize this thing now? Have we said enough about her characteristics and her ugly attributes and her methods and her motive? You know, the people in this church are anointed. We have a spiritual inheritance. That demon's after you. If you're in this congregation and desiring to serve and desiring to step up in the anointing and your calling in this ministry, the demon is after you. Whether in the workplace, in the church, in your home, I don't care who it's operating through, the demon's after you. Okay, so the first step. Recognize and repent. If the person doesn't have true repentance, which means they're willing to turn away and do the things that you as an authority or a pastor are asking them to do to show they are turning away, they're not truly repentant. If they tell you, well, pastor, I'm sorry, but you're not just hearing from God, right? God wouldn't ask me to do that. You must be wrong. They are not truly repentant. Number two, recognize the pattern and motive for control. In other words, now what we're talking about here, you guys, is our own stuff, okay? We're talking about our own fruit, judging ourselves, judging that demon trying to use and control us. We're going to repent and turn away from it. We're going to repent for agreeing with it. You other strong women out there, uh, come on, get honest. We've agreed with it. We do agree with it. We have to repent. Honey, that's control. I'm sorry. You're right. That was controlling. I'm, I'm very sorry, and thank you for pointing that out to me. Can you humble yourself enough to do that? Then you're going to recognize the pattern and your motives. Uh-oh, there I go again. You're right. Again, there I did it again. There I go again. Recognize the pattern and look at your motive. What's your motive? What is your motive for that display? Attention getting? Not getting your own way? Control? Well, my husband's going to love hearing this tape. Hallelujah. Hi, honey. Number three. My husband, in the future when he hears this, he's grinning real big right now. I can see you grinning. Number three. We have to recondition ourselves. How can you recondition something you don't recognize and repent for? We got to recondition ourselves. We're not going to react anymore. We're going to respond. We have to recondition ourselves to not react. That means first words that come to your mouth, first thing that comes to your head, no, shut up. We're going to listen to the Holy Ghost, and we're going to respond, not react. Amen? Number four, we're going to refuse to regress. We are going to relentlessly refuse to to regress. We cannot compromise with this demon. When the Lord shows you these tendencies in you and you recognize them, you better not only repent, but you better get your foot really set in the sand and don't cross that line. Do not cross it. That thing will eat your lunch. Ruthlessly refuse to regress. Number five, renounce all thought patterns that deal with control. Cast down all thoughts and imaginations that exalt themselves against the knowledge of God. Allow your husband to be the man in the family and the head of your household. Okay? So the five things again. Repent. Recognize the pattern and motive of control. Number three, recondition yourself to respond not react. 
wait, think. The Bible talks about being slow to speak and quick to listen. Number four, refuse to regress ruthlessly. Get really angry at that thing using you. The Bible says that we're to have a hatred for evil. If the evil's using you, you better hate it. It's going to use you all the way to your grave. Number five, renounce all thought patterns that deal with control. So that's how we're going to deal with that spirit trying to attack us, attack our family. Now, how are we going to deal with the individual? In the workplace, in the church, wherever it is that we're going to deal with this individual, because you, trust me, you're going to deal with them. They're everywhere, okay? The first thing you're going to do is you're going to confront it. Now, I've had to repent. I've had to repent for not confronting that thing because I didn't know how. <laughs> Look out, devil. I am mad, and I am not going to put up with it on my watch. Take notice. Confront it. Without confrontation, the person that's bound will remain in that pattern of control because they have be it has become a lifestyle to them. That's just how they think they are. Well, that's just my personality. That's just how I am. No, it's a demon. A big, bad, nasty demon. Wants to kill you and everybody around you. If you don't confront them, they won't have any motivation to change. You're not helping them by not confronting them. And you're not helping them by standing in the middle and protecting them from the confrontation. Get out of the way and let God be God. Their blood is going to be on your hands. Think you're rescuing that thing? That poor little pitiful, wimpy, everybody's against me and nobody loves me. And you're going to get in the way of that and the power of God to deliver her? The blood is on your hands. We're going to front, confront it. Hallelujah. Nicely. If we have that thing, we're going to be open to change. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit to change us. So we're going to confront that demon and somebody else. We're not going to let them change the subject. When they change the subject, we're going to bring them back to where they were. We're not going to allow it to confuse us. Amen. We're not going to allow it to use self-pity to get out of their responsibility. All those things that we talked about. And if it's affecting us or our family, we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to change us. You know what, ladies, gentlemen? We can't change ourselves. We can't do it. These people that carry this thing around, you know how many times they've tried to change themselves? They don't like how ugly they act either. They want to change. They're not willing to admit they got a demon, but they really would like to, by the power of their own flesh, change. Doesn't work. You need the Holy Ghost. You can't do it yourself. We have to give our spouse permission to write this word down lovingly and nicely confront us. I don't care if you're the man or the woman that deals with this thing. Now, a woman with a Jezebel spirit is not likely to marry a man that has the same strong, domineering quality. What she wants from you is to suck up your power and to use you. Then she's going to throw you away. A woman that wants to be in control will marry an Ahab. If by chance, especially in Christendom, she does marry somebody that's also strong, and that man may also have these same controlling Jezebel characteristics. She can't control you. Now you're married. The Bible says you can't get a divorce. Now she's going to control the children and the rest of the family. But your life is going to be a living hell. You, do you know that your pastor may know a thing or two? That your spiritual parents may know a thing or two? Do you know that your spiritual parents don't really like the job of having to say, uh, son, daughter, <laughs> that 
Their relationship's not from the Lord. We don't like it. I remember my son Wade. I'm going to use him as an example because I can. He, he came to me once and he said, Katie, I think that might be my wife. <laughs> I said, Wade, that is not your wife. I'll tell you what, he'll tell you to this day that he's really glad that he listened to me. But he didn't question it and he didn't say, well, she's wrong or she's just trying to control my life or she doesn't want me to be happy and she doesn't want me to be married and she thinks I'm a baby and I can make my own decisions. No, he said, she knows what she's talking about. She's my spiritual authority and I better take that heads up. Hello. Hello. So the next time he came to me and he said, uh, Katie, I think I met my wife. Oh, here we go again. Okay, Wade, I don't know this one, but we'll see. Well, there she sits. Praise God. I did want Wade happy. I did want him married and joyful, but to the right mate, not one that was going to make him miserable the rest of his life. Hallelujah. Listen, people, you've got children, right? Okay, so you go to your kids because you know more than them, especially the adolescent types. I'm smiling at you in the green shirt over there. Kids get to be an age where they think, you know, they're starting to know some things. They're getting old enough to make some of their own decisions. We as parents need to allow them to make decisions so they can grow up. So you come to your kid and say, uh, son, that's not a good idea. You're going to get hurt. You're going to have to pay a high price. You are making a mistake. Oh, man, Dad, what, I'm 18 and I know what I'm doing. You know, just, just give me a chance. You'll see. I know what's going on. Don't worry about me. There comes a time, if you don't want to be a Jezebel, that you have to let your kid make their own mistakes and their own decision. And you as a mother or a father or a pastor grieve because you see the cost that they're about to pay. And the cost is great. But they won't hear you. Now this demon when it's after you and your anointing. If you allow it to get close and it meets its eyes into the window of your soul and sees what's in there, loneliness, maybe rejection, need for approval, honey, you're in trouble. You are in big whopping trouble. This thing is a demon of witchcraft, and it causes you to become bewitched. You can't see, you can't hear, you are deceived, and without intervention from the Almighty, you are in some whopping big trouble. You better have some people of prayer and fasting and some intercessors to pull you out of this because you know what God is greater than that witch God almighty is greater than any individual witch and I don't care if they call themselves a Christian they're practicing witchcraft that makes you a witch help and deliverance is available in the body of Christ, in the local churches. But you have to submit to the body of Christ. Go to James. Is everybody all right? Is anybody learning anything? I hope I'm not boring you all too much. It's a hard message. But we have to be aware. We have to know our enemy. Amen? We have to know our enemy. How are you going to fight an enemy you don't know? And how are you going to get set, people set free if you can't discern and separate the demon from them? 
Or are you just going to say, hey, you're a witch, get out of my church? Honey, they're looking for help. They're crying out for help. You better learn how to help them. It's your job. We've been anointed to set the captives free. Amen? Not to call them names and send them out. James 4. My God, help us. Have mercy on your church in this end time. Raise us up in that spirit of Elijah and Elisha. Elijah never did quite fulfill what he was supposed to do because he hid from this thing. We are not going to hide. Amen? We will not hide. In the book of James, in, verse, in chapter 4, in verse 7, all right, the only way you're going to get rid of this thing is by deliverance. The only way you're going to get deliverance is by going to a spiritual authority. Okay, so you got to submit to the spiritual authority if you want deliverance. Hallelujah. So in verse 7 it says, Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. If you don't submit to God and godly authority, you can resist this thing all you want, but it ain't going nowhere. That's not what I say. That's what the Bible says. Quit trying to fight this thing in the flesh, ladies. You can't fight this thing that controls you to control others in the flesh. First Peter 5. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you for the Holy Ghost. Thank you for the power to deliver and set the captives free. Oh, the devil is such a liar. Oh, no, you will not steal the anointing devil. Oh, no, you will not steal the men of God from their purpose, devil, in the name of Jesus. Not in this house. Not in this house. First Peter 5. This is according to the word, you guys. I'm not just making this up. First Peter 5 and verse 5 and 6. Likewise, you younger people, younger in the Lord, submit yourself to your elders. Yes, all of you be submissive to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourself under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Submit yourself under the mighty hand of God that he can send you your wife in due time. Hallelujah. Trust God. Ego, E-G-O, easing God out. I don't need God to help me make my decision. I don't need the pastor to help me make my decision. You know, it's your own lusts that are helping you make your decision. 2 Corinthians, please, 13. Hallelujah. The demon of pride and fear are going to mask this thing and protect it. We have to humble ourselves. You can't be prideful and deny that you got a problem. You have to humble yourself. Remember that this spirit is a protector. We're going to 2 Corinthians 13. Now, right now, we're talking about how we're going to get set free and how we're going to set people free in the body of Christ. 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 1. This will be the third time I am coming to you by the mouth of how many witnesses? Two or three witnesses. Every word shall be established. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. Now I want to take that in two different directions. Number one, if everybody seems to be against you and everybody is telling you that you're not hearing from God, 
God puts us in a body for our safety. So chances are, probably, hello, you're wrong. Hello? If you seem to be just the only one that wants to protect this poor, pitiful, misunderstood, lonely witch, chances are you're probably wrong. You're in the body of Christ. In the multitude of counsel, there is safety and wisdom. Now, secondly, as far as this goes, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses, look at you got two or three people coming up to you and warning you, say, uh, heh, you're touching fire, let go. That's not God. You have a bunch of people telling you, this is what the word says. Okay? Not me. I'm not against you. I'm for you. Now, you get that thing mad because you've confronted it. And now it's going to come in. Get in the pastor's face and tell the pastor that he doesn't hear from God and that he's got to be wrong. Excuse me. The word says out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. Go to Ephesians 4. I'm telling you what the word of God says about this matter. In Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12. We're talking about the government and the authority in the kingdom of God. How God governs things, not how the pastor governs things. He didn't make this up. And he, Jesus himself, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and some teachers. For what? For the equipping of the saints and for the work of the ministry and for the edifying of the body of Christ. Not for the tearing down of the body of Christ. Your pastor is not trying to come against you. Your pastor is not trying to be non-supportive. Your pastor is trying to rescue your butt. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Go to Psalm 105, 15. We're almost done, and then we are going to pray. Psalm 105, 15. I don't want this thing on me. I repent for agreeing and fellowshipping with that ugly thing and letting it use me. I openly... I openly before this congregation repent to you for every time I have been controlling and manipulating. Every time. In all sincerity and humility of heart, I repent to you. Psalm 105, verse 15. If my husband were here, I'd repent to him. Openly. Openly. For the times I've said things in front of other people that contradict what he said. The Bible says in Psalm 105, verse 15, Do not touch my anointed ones, and do my prophets no harm. And in Samuel, it talks about when David who was anointed to be king but wasn't standing in the position yet. And Saul was out to kill him. And David had opportunity to kill Saul so that he wouldn't be killed. He was chasing him for his life. He could have turned around and killed him. And he chose not to because he was not going to touch a man that God had anointed. I am warning you people, do not come against the anointed of God. Do not come against your pastor when he's trying to rescue your life. Now, let's go to Psalm 
go to First Timothy. A couple more scriptures. We're almost done. You know, if you hear a word from your pastor and he tells you, don't go there, that's not God, and then you go there, you hear from the pastor and you repent, and then you listen to this demon talking in your ear and you get confused. And then you go back to the pastor and you repent, and then you go back and talk to that demon and you get all confused. And uh, you know what? Eventually you're going to stop listening to the pastor and you're going to only be listening to the demon. And you're going to be clueless why everybody else can see something you can't see. You just think everybody else has gone plumb nuts. First Timothy. I love you, Lord. Rescue your people. Rescue my children. Keep them safe. I trust you, Lord. Keep them safe. First Timothy 5, verse 19. Do not touch God's anointed and don't be out of order in your rebuke toward a pastor or a prophet or anybody else in the government of God. You are asking for trouble on your head. Do not receive an accusation against an elder. you go to your pastor if you can't find those people and everybody else seems to be against you or disagreeing with you hello you've been listening to a spirit of bewitchment you are in whopping big trouble you better get on your face and you better put the telephone down and quit listening to her We can be delivered of these things, can't we, my sweet sister? Thank you, Jesus. We can be delivered of these things. Thank you, Jesus. Now, if the counsel of your pastor is incorrect, pastors aren't perfect, okay? They're not perfect. But we don't pretend to know who your wife or your husband is or what job you should go to or even what church you're supposed, supposed to go to. Amen? If a pastor that you trust and is anointed and you have known to be a man or a woman of integrity and they've never done you wrong and they come to you with something, why would you have reason to not believe them unless you've been listening to a devil? If they're wrong, which Lord knows... Pastors are human. They can be wrong. They can be listening to a demon too. Okay? But if they are wrong, and you listen to them, what harm is done? You're still protected. Right? You're protected. But if the counsel is correct and you disobey, ouch, you are unprotected you have just opened yourself up you have you have disregarded and said i don't want headship i don't want a covering i want to be myself i just eased god out i don't need you making my decisions and now your life is going to piece by piece fall apart while the parents who love you and tried to warn you have to watch you be all so grown up. Hallelujah. It's going to affect your family. It's going to affect your job. It's going to affect your finances. It's going to strip you of your anointing and your purpose in the kingdom. And then it's going to leave you to rot. all alone, to pick up the pieces and start over. To have to mend your lives again with your children. 
to have to start all over again in the workplace, whatever it is, however that thing takes you down. God places us in families to protect us. Now in Revelation 2. Closing scripture. In verse 20. Let's start at verse 18. In the angel of the church of Thyatira, right? These things says the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet like a fine brass. God is admonishing them. I know your works, your love, your service, your faith, your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. You're growing. You're doing good. You're loving the people. You're doing good works. You're doing good service. You're building them up in faith. You're doing better than you were before. Nevertheless, says Jesus Christ the Almighty, I have a few things against you because you allowed that woman, Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess to teach and seduce my servants my anointed one, to commit sexual immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. I have given her time to repent of her sexual immorality, and she did not repent. Indeed, I will cast her into her sickbed and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of their deeds. I will kill her children with death, and all the churches, the churches shall know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your works. That is the Lord God Almighty chastening a church a body for allowing that demon to operate. It will not happen on my watch. And I repent for anything that I have done to not know or recognize or be ignorant of what I now know. And we're all going to repent of not knowing what we now know. But this live teaching, hallelujah, I know a lot now. The Bible said, hey, yo, these are the people in our congregation that aren't doing the right thing. Named them by name. When they wouldn't repent, love was showed, mercy was showed, deliverance was offered. Mercy, mercy, mercy. Listen, you guys, we're always to err on the side of mercy. Our mistakes are God's problem. God will fix them. But we have to err on the side of mercy. We have to consider that God is in the people-fixing business, not the church-building business. We have to care more about that one sheep than we do about our agenda or our programs. You have to love that person. You have to try to bring them with the love of God into a place of understanding where they want to be delivered. You have to have enough fruit to make them want to be like you are instead of like how they are. If you're trying to do it with control and manipulation, you're not showing them anything. But if they don't repent, my king has commanded me to put them out. Does that hurt a pastor? Is someone with a pastor's heart? You betcha. You betcha. Hallelujah. But this is the word, and we are going to act according to it. 
Just to end and, and mention that if we tolerate these things in our secular life, in our, in our workplace, that it opens up a door to your personal and your spiritual life too. Don't tolerate that thing even in the workplace. When we tolerate Jezebel, there's no place for peace. It hinders God's power and flow in our lives. And it affects our effectiveness for the kingdom of God. Father, we thank you for the word. We thank you that we are men and women enough to receive the word with repentance. That we receive this word as from you, Lord, not as from a man or from a woman. Now, Lord, we repent in the name of Jesus for anything and all things that we have done to cooperate with this spirit, Lord. The women that are controlling, the women that walk after you, Lord God, but use control and spiritual authority to manipulate people, Lord, we repent. Father, we repent for agreeing with this spirit that is trying to take our very lives and to kill the anointed men and women of God. We repent. Father, we repent as a church body. The House of True Ministries repents for allowing this spirit of Jezebel to seduce and manipulate and use us. Lord, we repent for any that may fall by the wayside and are unwilling to see it. We ask you to rescue them. But Lord, we trust you. Lord, we trust you to change us. We trust your Holy Spirit to convict us with love, not condemn us. We trust you to be a loving father that wants to free your children, not beat them up. I thank you for the power of deliverance. Lord, we desire to be delivered. We desire to change. And we desire to be used to deliver others. Father, thank you. We count every trial and tribulation as joy. Everything that we have been through because of this demon, Lord, we thank you that we're going to use it to set the captives free. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. I speak a blessing over this congregation. And I say in the name of Jesus Christ, the King, that the spirit of Jezebel will not op operate in this place. That the people of God will repent. I speak to this congregation saying that you will not run away from the anointing. You will repent. You will not take down the church nor the men and women of God. I speak repentance. Lord, I ask that your power and your anointing become so great that when people walk in that door, they fall on their face in repentance and that this thing is clearly exposed, that they don't even have to be confronted because they see it for themselves. I'm asking you to bring great revelation. And help us to walk in love. Oh Lord, we promise to give you all the honor and glory. I plead the blood of Jesus upon the seed. I ask that it be implanted in the, the hearts that you've given us that are flesh, Father. Cleanse those stony hearts. Give us a heart of flesh. And I plead the blood of Jesus over this world. We repent as wives for manipulating our husbands. We repent as mothers for manipulating our children. Oh, God, have mercy. And I thank you for this word that has gone forth, that is going to change and grow up this congregation and go even further out into the body and out into the world for the glory of God as we go forth in the spirit of Elijah, preparing the way for the Lord in his power, and in his authority. In Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody give the Lord a hand.